Hello F1 fans and welcome to F1 On and Off the Track with Kim Illman. You can see his photos at ProStarPicks.com or follow him on Instagram at Kim Illman. My name is Adrian and in this episode, we're talking about Charles Leclerc's first win. And what a day it was for Charles. Lovely to be there. I've, uh, I've hoped all season that I would be there for his first win. I only missed the race in Canada. So secretly, I was hoping, don't make that your first win because I'm not going to be there. But uh, yeah, great great to see the youngster win. He, um, he drove perfect race. Uh, just exciting times. In fact, after the race, I spent probably 90 minutes following him from uh, Parc Ferme out the back to the interview pen, back up to the media conference, back of the Ferrari garage where he did another couple of media things and then out the front to do a celebration. Now, the interesting thing is Ferrari don't typically do celebrations when their team wins. However, they made an exception because it was his first win. And uh, there's a lovely moment which I posted a pic on Instagram last night, my time here, uh, where they were all getting set to do the shot and there's all the team, and in the front row behind the board is Charles and Mattia Bonotto. And they said, Where, where's Seb? Where's Seb? And then they're all pointing back, because Seb's standing right in the very back row, and I thought it was a lovely gesture on Seb's part, not to take any limelight away. That's what I gathered mm. was his reasoning. And he just stood up the back there and let Charles bask in that joy of, of winning your first race. And while it was an exciting weekend for Charles, it was also a sad weekend with the passing of Antoine Aubert, the French F2 driver. That, that happened on the Saturday afternoon. The accident happened at, I think it was 5.07 p.m. And it was a savage collision um, on track at the top of uh, Radion. And he was pronounced dead at about 6.30 p.m. And it really hit home with everyone. And certainly Instagram was just full of tributes to uh, the youngster. I'd never photographed him. I'd never talked to him or met him. I would have seen him, but perhaps not taken any uh, real note of the youngster. But I do know he was uh, very good friends of Pierre Gasly's. They spent years at school and growing up uh, in the racing world together. He was very well known to Charles and I imagine to a couple of the other youngsters who grew up with uh, him as a competitor and a teammate perhaps uh, through the racing days. But a really surreal atmosphere come Sunday. And I, I got there early because I, th I thought I, I want to document how the F1 community um, reacts to this. And I got there early. People were um, sombre, um, talk, a lot of people talking about it. And I went for a walk up in the public area to see if I could um, get down into the area where the crash happened. Because when I was coming back on Saturday night, I, I drove across the the track in the media bus and you could see this was probably about 7 p.m. still all of the rescue vehicles with their lights flashing up there uh, and I believe they were there for a heck of a long time obviously it was um, required for the coroner and all the investigations but uh, when I went up on um, early on Sunday morning I noticed that there were all these emergency vehicles filing past in two by two formation and then I realized that it was a tribute to um, Antoine and they all stopped just about the spot where um, uh, the collision happened. And I took a couple of pictures of that. They weren't great pictures, but when I posted them on social me media, just um, mentioning that this was uh, one of the early tributes in the morning, it was really well appreciated. And uh, it was one of my biggest posts. So people were crying out for information on what was happening. How was the uh, F1, F2 and F3 community handling this and then of course later in the day before the f3 race there was a minute silence out on the grid and that was heart-wrenching and there were many people in tears um and i i can't believe that uh, antoine's mother and brother uh were there it was uh, a show of love for them they stood amongst all of the uh, probably 200 odd people on the track and then afterwards a lot of the drivers the young drivers came up and hugged uh, his mother and uh, it was hard not to have tears in your eyes. Certainly a lot of the drivers and um, uh, officials were, were teary, and it was the same shooting from the other side of the camera. You, you see uh, something that you know, I hope I never see again, and I wouldn't have thought I would have ever seen it. So, yeah, an amazing day, and then there was another minute silence before the race, and when Charles won, he uh, looked to the sky when he got out of the car, 
pointed up there. I guess that's probably not only for Antoine, but for his father who passed away earlier this year. And uh, for, it wasn't early this year or last year. Um, I think it was last year. Uh, and then uh, also his good friend Jules Bianchi. So a really amazing day to be at the Belgian Grand Prix. Moving to talk more about the race, I believe it's no longer possible to shoot from behind the barriers at Eau Rouge. Well, no, I thought that was the case, but it is possible, but you have to be locked in there for the entire session. Uh, previously, you could enter through a gate and be safe when you walk to this uh, bottom of the corner and shoot through the, the railing or above the railing because they come past at such a frighteningly fast speed and they're very close to you. You can actually get in there, but you have to stay the whole session and it pretty much resigns you to a couple of shots. So um, I didn't even bother going down there. I didn't want to spend a whole session there. But there were a few people who put in the uh, hard yards and, and did that. And they were richly rewarded with some great shots. Now, speaking of great shots, there was also an excellent one you got of Vettel and Leclerc. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm struggling to think. That was uh, Thursday morning. Yes. And the drivers had all returned from their summer break. And I'd uh, seen Charles and... I took a couple of shots of him and asked him a question or two about something I needed an answer on. Then he went up into the engineering motorhome. Seb I saw on a bike come around and uh, stop at the back of the Ferrari garage. So I went and shot him, and he's always pretty relaxed. He'll hang around for five and six minutes talking to people, and you just walk around three or four metres away and just shoot away quietly. And then I had a wide-angle lens, and over my right shoulder I see this uh, shadow, and I glimpse out the side of my uh, viewfinder and see Charles. And I think, oh, great, he's going up to say hello to these two mechanics and Seb, and sure enough he does, and I get this lovely shot of him um, high-fiving or shaking hands with Sebastian at the back of the garage, and nicely for me, I was the only one there to capture it. So that, that photo was quite popular. There were also rumours throughout the weekend that Kimi Raikkonen might not have been racing. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, that was mainly uh, Thursday afternoon, Friday morning. And I, and I was Thursday afternoon because I, <laughs> I went to the press uh, interview at Thursday afternoon out the front of the garage. And uh, I heard the press officer say to one of the journalists that that is nonsense. He'll, he'll be racing. Um, he had, a, I think, an injury to a leg which may have affected his ability to brake because apparently you need quite a little bit of pressure on your, uh, on your left foot for braking because they brake with their left and accelerate with their right. He raced. Uh, he didn't have a very good race on Sunday because he got cleaned up by Max Verstappen at turn one, and that pretty much put pay to any chance he had of doing well. I think he finished, but it was certainly uh, was second last, I think, of all the finishes. But that first corner was quite eventful too because... Uh, Carlos Sainz ran very wide, and I couldn't work out, and, and you've got to understand that pretty much as soon as we finish shooting, we were editing, and, and we don't get a chance to really get a great deal of information about what happened, so I'm still not sure what happened to Carlos, but he ran very wide, and it appeared he wasn't going that well, and then, of course, Max pulled up, had a crash in the in the first lap as well because of that incident with Kimi, and Daniel Ricciardo had an incident, and he was shunt, shunted back, and I think Nico Hulkenberg also had an incident. So it was action-packed, but my gosh, if you haven't heard the audio of Lando Norris coming to a stop on the last lap you want to, it is hilarious. Poor guy, he's in fifth position. He's thinking, great, I'm going to have my best ever finish. And he ends up, well, I think he was classified as 11th in the end, but, oh, very sad for the young Brit. You also got the opportunity to photograph an interview with Ziggo Sport with Max and Seb. Yeah, uh, that was lovely because you don't often see those two together in a relaxed setting and there weren't many people around, maybe 20 people. If that had been done on a Sunday, you wouldn't have been able to get anywhere near it. But uh, yeah, it was lovely to watch them interact. And I think in the end, the, the two hosts of the uh, Dutch TV show ended up just giving up and saying, oh, you, you take it over on your own. And they gave a microphone to each of the drivers and they did their own little mini show on Dutch television. Uncharacteristically for Lewis, he crashed in FP3. Yes, I was uh, shooting in the pits and I had my earphones on and um, we had about a 30 second delay between something happening and what you hear about uh, through BBC Five Live. Uh, yeah, and I heard Lewis has crashed at whatever turn it was. And I thought, oh, that's too far for me to get, but no doubt he'll be uh, whisked back here somehow. But the question was, would he come into the back of the garage or would he come into the front of the garage? And um, so I went down there and I took a punt on the front of the garage and was right because the medical car had grabbed him, picked him up, dropped him off at the front of the garage and there was a, quite a throng of people there 
but I managed to get a good shot of him coming um, underneath the uh, little ropes that are out in the front of the garage. It was clutching the side of his body, and I got a couple of shots away with a wide-angle lens that was sharp, and um, I think that was probably the shot to get if you weren't standing down there at the, the crash site when the car hit the tyre barrier. But anyway, he, uh, he qualified, the mechanics got it all fixed, and full marks to them. I think they only had two and a half hours, and uh, that's a fair effort. Uh, and yeah, he ended up on the podium come race day. F1 On and Off the Track is presented by ProStarPix.com. Stunning F1 photos live from the track, searchable and downloadable for personal or editorial use. Head to ProStarPix.com at the end of this podcast. Now, you did a fun little post on your Instagram about what drivers had more likes over a week period. Can you tell us about that? I had not much content to put up in the lead up to the Belgian race. So I thought I'd put up a, a post about each driver and there were 10 pictures of each driver. And I kept a record of who liked what. And they all went up at different times of the day and at different times of the week. And it ended up being Daniel Ricciardo was by far the most um, popular driver. And then people were saying, oh, I know, but it, you, you didn't put them all up. They didn't have as long up. But all of the action really happens in the first day. So at the end of the first day, you get about 95% of all the reaction. Then that sort of trickles in over the coming days. But um, it just went to show that um, the people that follow my page are Daniel Ricciardo fans, Leclerc fans, Vettel fans, Lando Norris fans. So they're probably the, um, the major four. And then I have to do some more work on perhaps getting more followers of the likes of Kibitza. And in fact, I took a beautiful photo of Robert coming out uh, or coming into the paddock um, Saturday morning. And I, I thought it was one of the best pictures I'd taken. He had light on one side of his face and darkness on the other and uh, looked quite menacing and powerful. So that was uh, probably my best pick of Robert. My favourite part of that was the stats, like that 11% of your fan base is from Italy, 9 from the UK, 7 from the US, and then 6 from Australia and Brazil. Yeah, the 7% from America is quite bizarre because it's not a strong F1 country. The 11% I understand from Italy because I do have quite a bit of content from uh, Charles and Seb. And obviously, the more content you have there, more people are drawn in and typically they're uh, Italians that love Ferrari. Uh, Australia, yes. Obviously, I'm based in Australia, so I probably have a, a good following there. And Brazil, Brazil, go figure. There's no Brazil drivers. It's a great race, and they are passionate about their F1. But, um, yeah, I, I, I also like looking at the stats, the number of cities uh, that are popular. London is one of the cities that I've got most followers in. And Perth, obviously, because that's where I'm from. Well, we're talking about Italy, so let's talk about the upcoming Monza race. Yeah, what's the trip like? Yeah, it's, a, it's a very pleasant one hour in a plane. And uh, I've got a couple of days in Milan. There's a very big event on the Wednesday in Milan where they've got uh, lots and lots of cars right in the centre. So I'll go and have a look at that. I might even take my camera down and take a few shots. And then we head to uh, Monza, which is, oh, I think, about 40 minutes from Milan. I have a nice little apartment there. But my gosh, I remember from two years ago, because I didn't do that race last year, neither did I do a spa last year. But the crowds at the autograph session are just out of control. They are super crazy. And they're, they're 10 to 20 deep, especially in front of the Ferrari garage. So uh, when you want to see passionate Formula One fans, this is the place to go, Monza. And uh, at the other end of the spectrum, if you want to see hardly any passionate F1 fans, that's China. Based on Ferrari's win here, you got to think that there are a strong chance in Monza, and certainly that's what everybody was saying yesterday, that uh, it's, a, it's a fast track and the straight-line speed of the Ferraris is superior to Mercedes-Benz. So you never know. It could be back-to-back -back wins for the red team. Well, speaking of the track, what is it like to get around, and are there any signature shots of the track? Uh, I like the first corner. Uh, a, it's easy to get to from the paddock. Uh, it's a chicane. And then you can also go out on this platform that sticks out over the top of the track. Now, I didn't get a chance to do that two years ago, but I'll be putting my name to, down to do it at this race because there really is no other track where you can go right above the uh, cars and shoot them as they go at frighteningly quick speeds uh, right underneath you. 
Um, there's also uh, a nice little exit uh, from one side of the paddock to get out to uh, uh, the other ch chicane on the other side. So um, I, I tend not to go to the far reaches of the track because it's, it's just a heck of a long walk. And um, it's, I don't think they have a good bus. No, it, it tends to be a, a walking track. So, yeah, I'll, I'll stay close to the paddock again and look for the stories. And you know, this weekend I, I found lots of stories. In fact, this morning I just put up my... Um, women in the F1 paddock and I tell you people love those photos as much as it's a man's sport I think they're all interested in, in um, the women of the sport and some of them that I feature are working others are girlfriends of drivers some are just guests but uh, I do actively look for various um, shots of, of women in the paddock and and uh, I, I came across one lady who was immaculately dressed and I stopped her for a photo and then I had a quick chat with her afterwards. She's from Melbourne, Melbourne girl. And I don't often meet too, too many Aussies in the paddock. So there you go. That's uh, Monza coming up. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Kim. I hope you enjoy Monza. I shall enjoy Monza. And uh, I really enjoy it when people send me photos. It was funny on the weekend. I was shooting down in the moat next to the track. And uh, occasionally when there's a lull, I'll get my phone out and just see what's happening. And I, I noticed that... Um, a, two people actually throughout the weekend in similar situations have sent me pics and said, is that you down there? And I think that's so funny because um, up until probably about six months ago, I'd never really had that much interaction with people via social media because I didn't really post much importance on it. But it's always appreciated when, when people send me that sort of stuff or even say hello at the track. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a real buzz. And I had my wife shooting with me this weekend and I think somebody even... In fact, I know two people sent me photos of her and who is this woman? Who? Why is she carrying your camera? Because it's got my um, Kim Elman logo all across the um, the lens and um, they've, they've picked that out. To see any of the photos we've talked about today, head over to ProStarPics.com or KimElman.com. You can also stay updated by following Kim on Instagram at Kim Elman. If you like what you heard today, please give us a review and remember to hit subscribe to stay posted for our next episode. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you on and off the track. F1 On and Off the Track was presented by ProStarPix.com. Stunning F1 photos live from the track, searchable and downloadable for personal or editorial use. ProStarPix.com. Head there now.